appears to be early morning on this unknown planet situated in an unknown universe. Dr. Schwick and his companion Newton wake up in the middle of a forest and this planet's two suns appear right above their heads to wake them with a warm ray of heat. The doctor's companion, Newton, is a very smart and talkative newt that he befriended many years ago in a galaxy far away. Newton is snugly situated in the front pocket of Doc's jacket and steadily tries to go deeper into the pocket to avoid the glare of the two suns. Once on his feet, Doc surveys his surroundings and tries to figure out where they are. Newton, after giving up finding a cooler spot, crawls effortlessly upon the doctor's shoulder to take a closer look ahead. Newton asks, where even are we? Visibly frustrated, the doctor replies, what did I tell you about your proper use of the language of my home planet? Newton sarcastically replies, la dda, dot who is here to hear us? Do we have an appointment with Aquila and the bees? Newton finished his sentence with a belt of laughter because he knew the movie he just referenced was properly titled, Aquila and the Bee. As they walked down a cleared path of the forest, the doctor replied, I see someone has been in my box of VHS movies. Before Newton could respond, they both heard a noise and eventually saw a nearby bush shaking as if something was trying to escape out of it. As they approached the bush, they could notice the small, oval, dark green leaves of the bush moving out of sync versus what you would expect from a strong wind. Now crouched in an investigative posture, the Schwick and Newton attempt to peer inside the bush. Before they could make out what they saw, a hulking figure leaps from the boxwood bush and belts out a horrid scream in the direction. The shadowy figure appears to be at least eight feet tall with broad shoulders and ears that were sitting straight up like some sort of furry antennae. Once the shadowy figure lays eyes on them, a run ensues and the doctor takes off deep into the forest with Newton holding closely to the collar of his coat. Newton manages to look back and catch a glimpse of the figure and states, who ordered the demon dog. A few miles away, a school bus driver is making the normal rounds of dropping students off at their respective destinations. Cameron sits near the middle of the bus because he knows he is usually the last person to get dropped off. If he sits too far up front everyone will have to walk past him and sometimes over him and if he sits too far in the back he may be confused with the louder kids in the back and doesn't want to get a bad bus card report. The bus is the traditional yellow school bus utilized in America on planet Earth and also on this planet. Hard seats, and for some reason, a lack of seat belts. Cameron peers outside of the window and watches the trees and cars speed by and before he knew it, he felt himself dozing off. An abrupt stop woke him up and he saw he was close to home. He recognized Rick's diner, that has always been his landmark to being a block away from home. As he was wondering how to tell his mom that he wanted french fries for dinner, a little ball of fur caught his eye. Once the bus dropped him off, Cameron immediately ran to the spot where he thought he saw the little ball of fur. He was really intrigued by this because he has always wanted a pet, and his parents were always hesitant about getting him one. Hopefully, he could bring his new friend home and prove to his parents that he is responsible enough for a pet. With a backpack full of books tugging heavily on his shoulders, he slowly canvasses the area for signs of his new furry best friend. After several moments, all seemed to be lost but out of the corner of his eye, he saw the cutest little dog that he had ever seen in his young life. From the bus it looked to be brownish-gray, but up close he could clearly see a mix of brown, white, with some specks of black. Cameron immediately picked up his new friend and ran home to tell his parents that they have a new addition to the family. Back in the forest, it appears that Dr. Schwick and Newton avoided the beast by hiding under a few bushes that sat next to a large tree. As things quiet down, the doctor says, Phew that was close, we need to check this out. Maybe that is the reason we are on this planet. Newton looks up and replies, Of course, here we are, quantum leaping to a random planet, a random universe with some random angry rabbit wolf thing. It's too many, randos, for my liking. Dr. Schwick proceeds to search in his intergalactic doctor bag to retrieve some tools to help assess the situation. 
Aha, he exclaims, here is my new stethoscope that can track and measure energy fields from miles away. Let's follow our new friend and see if we can figure out what's going on. Back at his home, Cameron has prepared a nice makeshift bed near the side of his bed. He has grabbed a few dishes out of the dishwasher to serve as food and water bowls. Cameron finished his homework and is very excited to spend his first sleepover with his new best friend. The puppy has to be no more than a month old. He has big attentive eyes, a short stubby tail, and oversized paws that were surely made for another puppy. Once settled, Cameron's mind ran through possible names until he fell asleep. According to the clock in the hallway of Cameron's home, it is just after midnight and a small crowd of animals have congregated under a big tree near the neighborhood park. The animals vary from rabbits with once soft white fur now covered in leathery skin with patches of fur to once adorable dogs of all sorts now standing on their hind limes with deep sunken eyes, long claws, and a low mumbling growl that persists amongst all of the animals. The crowd of animals increases as time goes on. On a hill situated in the middle of the park, a larger-than-life ant creature commands a crowd of zombie animals that are intensely listening to every word. The ant villain yells to the rowdy crowd, my project is almost complete. My alteration of the fungus cordyceps will infect every animal and we will have complete domination. This proven fungus has taken over my ant family for years and turned them into zombies to do the bidding of the fungus. Today we have harnessed the power of the zombie ant fungus to give us power beyond our wildest dreams. We have found a way to place this in the pet food. Cordy's own pills will be our future and the world will be our park. The crowd groans and cheers wildly. Not too far away, Doc and Newton manage to catch up to the unknown creature and grab some fur to sample as well as some small bits of what appears to be some sort of kibble that is usually associated with dog food they found on the ground near it. They take the samples to an abandoned animal hospital to run some samples. As they approach the clinic cautiously, they see that it sits up on a hill. There are two floors and there appears to be some sort of pet boarding facility in the back. They go around back to find a door to open and once inside they utilize Doc's special watch to scan for items they can use to analyze their findings. They find a microscope and attach the Megabot to analyze the hair and kibble. Doc tells Newton that this is definitely dog food but there appears to be growth of Ophiocodyceps unilateralis, or in other words, the zombie ant fungus. As the shipments of contaminated pet food spread across the land, Doc and Newton have a small window to stop this diabolical plan. The evening appears to be quiet but slowly every mild-mannered pet is feeling uneasy and not really sure of the strange feeling that appears to be taking over. Twinkles had only been with his new family for a short time but this new home is definitely better than the streets. The soft bed and free access to food makes it feel like home. Despite all the comfort, he felt uneasy, restless, and his skin felt itchy all over his body. As the evening marched on, Twinkles could hear all sorts of various animal sounds outside of his window. Some sounded like growls, some were horrifying moans, and some were very hard to describe. Back at the animal clinic, Doc sits with Newton to devise a plan. If every pet is fed this tainted food with the zombie ant fungus, we are going to need something to combat it ASAP, says Doc. Doc pauses and continues, what if we find a way to destroy the fungus by using the water supply? This would require a favor from the Rat King. Years ago, the Rat King's daughter took a liking to Doc during a visit to the Zeta Reticuli star system. As customary in rat culture, the female rats exhibit strong definitive choices on who they choose and her choice for the dock was heard loud and clear throughout the galaxy. While trying to learn the language of the rat race, he inadvertently agreed to marry her. Before he realized his mistake, there was a wedding planned and before he could correct it, he was zapped off into the next adventure. Many years passed, and Doc thought that maybe this situation was forgotten about and water under the bridge, until now. The doctor sees a rat run by and he quickly scoops him up and gives him a message to deliver to the rat king. The rat nods his head and scurries off down the sewer. 
As Doc and Newton watch the rat's tail disappear from view, they both look at each other and say simultaneously. And now we wait. Moments later, a thunderous rumble is felt under the streets and everyone could feel the vibrations getting closer and closer. Suddenly, all of the manholes burst open and thousands of rats spill into the street. Once the street is completely covered in rats of all shapes and sizes, the Rat King arrives on his chariot to begrudgingly greet the dock. The Rat King appears to stand seven feet tall once he rises out of his chair. His head is adorned with an intricate display of medallions and trinkets of various sizes and shapes formed to make a crown. The Rat King looks around confidently, pauses, and slowly descends down a flight of steps made of rats. Who dares summon Ninkalim, Lord Rodent, yells the Rat King. Facing the Rat King and rats as far as the eyes could see, Doc states his problem on this planet and how access to the water supply and his help may prevent all of the pets turning into zombies. Why should I help you? See, Ninkalim. The Rat King continued, why should I help you in this planet? Do you know how I looked when you didn't show up for my daughter's wedding? Doc gives an inquisitive look to the Rat King and replies, can't we discuss this later? Isn't there a saying? Um, dot the doc extends his hands to his heart and quotes Elizabeth Bowen, fate is not an eagle, it creeps like a rat. The rat king is clearly not amused, but the doc continues, if it is meant to be my dear friend, fate will yield it so, dot but on this day we can right this immediate wrong and save this planet from a zombie invasion, what say you? The rat king stares at the rat council. The moment of silence is interrupted with murmurings of inaudible squeaks among the gaggle of rats. The Rat King turns around to the dock and speaks in a low tone, what do you need? Doc replies, right now. All of the pets have been exposed to this fungus through food or the air and I've created this reversal potion that I believe we can put into the water supply and turn the zombie pets back to normal, with your help of course. The Ant King is planning a huge event at the clock tower at 10.04 p.m. All we need to do is have the rats divert the city's water supply so I can treat it with the potion and spray the pets at this meeting to turn them back to normal, explains Doc. On the other side of town, the Ant King and Ant Queen descend upon the town square flanked by the zombified version of Chihuahuas, Dobermans, Mutts, rescued dogs, strays, cats, and ferrets to name a few. The look in the Ant King's eyes is one of determination to not fail at his plan. Moments later, the entire town square is covered by zombie pets. On the far side of the courtyard, Doc and Newton appear with the Rat King and over a thousand rats. The sky is now dark grey and the Schwick emblem around Doc's neck is now glowing. The Ant King yells, who dares stand in my way? Doc replies, I come as a protector of galaxies, superhero to those animals in need, carrier of the Schwick amulet and this ends now. The Ant King raises his hands in the air and the legion of animal zombies rush to attack. As the zombie animals and rats collide, Doc holds the Schwick amulet and repeats, Audi me Audi me omnia animae prope procul, which loosely translates in Latin to mean, hear me, hear me all animals near and far. The winds begin the blow and the rats work to push over buckets of potion water into the crowd. Wherever the rats could find water, they apply it to the zombies. The Ant King is furious as his zombie army is turning back into normal pets. The Ant King escorts the Ant Queen under an umbrella and prepares to flee the scene. At this moment, the Schwick amulet emits a purplish gold ray that emanates through the crowd and each drenched animal is back to normal. The pet parents arrive on the scene and are reunited with the beloved pets. Doc and Newton search the area for the Ant King and he is nowhere to be found. Newton notices a squirrel pointing in the direction of a small clearing. Doc and Newton immediately race to the clearing and notice a small path. They see the Ant King and Queen frantically running towards some sort of opening in the ground. Doc can feel himself gaining behind him so he leaps to grab him before he enters this obscure hole in the ground. Just as he leaps to grab them, a bright light flashes. Doc and Newton feel themselves being hurled off into a cosmic ray headed towards another galaxy, another planet, until next time.